Um, I am Anna Murphy, fashion director of the Times, and the lady next to me, I'm sure, needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever. We're going to give you one anyway. It is, of course, Jade Holland Cooper, Thank founder you. of Holland Cooper, the very fabulous brand that she is looking amazing in, and I'm looking slightly less amazing in. Um, and I'm sure I'm looking, seeing some pretty fabulous looks out there as well. Um, and we're here just to have a lovely time, really. Um, we're going to chat. You're going to drink some bubbles. Um, we'll probably chat for about half an hour, just so you know how the morning's going to pan out. Then I've got some questions that you've um, already submitted. Then we're both going to be around to um, have a chat with you all. I'm going to sign some books. You can come onto the stage to have your picture taken with us, should you so desire. So, um, but mainly, yeah, we're just going to have a really nice time on this very lovely sunny day. Thank goodness it's not yesterday. It we shows, booked the weather. We I was going to say, it shows the power of Holland Keeper that you can even <laughs> kind of dial, dial in the right weather. Um, so, yeah, Jade, so many questions I want to ask you about you and the brand. But the first one is, I mean, here you are, peak, peak fashion. <laughs> Looking back, dialing the clock all the way back to childhood, is there a moment, is there a fashion moment you can call to mind when you're a little girl? It's like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. This is, this is me. I mean, were you very demanding with your school uniform? Were you kind of wearing, wearing tweed at three? Talk, talk I, me through I, it. I'm going to say I was the complete opposite. Interesting. Um, Tell me I more. was really, really shy as a child. Um, I wanted nothing more than just to be out in the garden riding. I had my chickens. I wore basically the same outfit every day, my jodhpurs and an old jumper. So I think no is the answer to that. But I was always around, you know, my mother had a, an amazing fashion business that was based on the farm in Suffolk. So I was always around clothes and I appreciated clothes. I have to say, I might make your mum, your very fabulous mum, stand up for a minute. <laughs> Oh, she she's going to hate that. She looks so Holland Cooper. She is I a mean, style icon. Check I it mean. out. <laughs> There's, yeah, there, there's a style icon right there. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I was surrounded by that, which, you know, I feel incredibly grateful for. And I think as I got older, clothes naturally became more important. But um, I think it probably wasn't until uh, I was at, at university or, or leaving school that I really started to notice more and, and pay more attention to what were people wearing, what did I want to wear. And I think that's how the journey began, really. And it's interesting that you talk about being shy, because one of the things that always interests me as a, as a fashion writer and a fashion consumer, and one of the things I write about in the book, is this, this, this degree to which clothes can change the way yes. you present to the world yes. and actually change the way you sort of feel about yourself, how clothes oh, can give you confidence. Yes, it, they're empowering. And I see this all the time. And it's a really amazing journey to go on with people or, or watch people go through, especially, you know, I see it all the time in the boutique. People come in, they have an amazing appointment, they try incredible clothes on and you, you almost see their demeanor change and, and they're standing up straighter and stronger. And I'm, I'm a huge advocate that clothes are incredibly powerful. And I think it's the same for all of us. Today I put on a suit, I thought, right, I, I can do this today. Yeah. Um, and there's something about tailoring especially, isn't there? Because one of the anecdotes that really I found most fascinating is I was talking once to the founder of Smartworks, which I'm sure is a charity that many of you know, and they work with women who basically can't get jobs. They've, they've had dealings with the social services. They may have a prison record. They're failing to get employed. Smartworks takes donations, essentially, from women like us, takes typically tailoring donations from women like us. They give these women training how to be interviewed, how to get a job. But they said to me, it's the moment they put on a suit and they see themselves in the mirror, and in the mirror, they see someone who's got a job. Yeah, and they're like, yeah. oh, actually... I, I can, can do this. Do this. Yeah. And it is that, it's the kind of that Wonder Woman moment, isn't it? You kind of whirl around and yeah. you're in your, you know, you're in your hot pants, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> and you feel you can do anything. You can do it. Yeah. And, and that is what's so incredible about clothes and retail. And that's how it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And I, another question about your childhood. I mean, one of the things that's, I mean, I love brands that are kind of headed up by women because I think, surprise, surprise, they get what we need they you know yeah. they are the consumer yeah but also I think what's clear whenever I talk to you is that you're very much focused on the design side of things but you're very much focused on the business side of things too you've got a business mind I want you to talk to me about your earliest commercial enterprise which I believe involved eggs 
I had an egg business. As you do. Um, How old were you when you had your egg business? I think I was eight or nine. Okay. And I Start took early. it very seriously. So I had, I, we actually, I went home a few years ago and I found my first little book where I'd written out, you know, one bucket bought feed and I'd done the little mini P&L. What was I making? How many eggs could I sell? And I think by the end of it, I had about 40 chickens. So I took that quite seriously. It was like a growth business. I started with eight, <laughs> ended up with 40. Um, but I, I loved I loved the t trading side of it. And I think um, that's what I still love, is making a product that sells, that's commercial, that people want. Um, and I think that's, you've got to have that love and that 360 understanding of not only design, but also business, because the two go hand in hand to make a successful business. You can't really have one without the other. Mm. I mean, it's amazing how many people in fashion sort of think you can. You can't. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. you can't. And I think, the, you know, I love both sides equally. And I think I love the design, but I also love the business and the commercial side and understanding that and understanding the numbers. And, you know, my, I remember my dad saying to me, um, you know, Jade, look, there's millions of great designers out there. There aren't millions of people that can put the the financial and the business element and combine the two. And if you can do that, you've probably got a shot. So mm. I've always taken that. And, you know, I had to understand all the finances before I employed anyone to do with accounts. So that the numbers is as important to me as, mm. as the product. And when was that moment when Holland Cooper sort of came into your mind? And what was, what is it? If you had to sort of sum up what you offer, to someone who hasn't seen the brand, who isn't sitting here today, who doesn't love the brand, who doesn't know what you do, what what are you offering that no other brand offers? And, and when and how did that kind of encapsulation come to you? I, I think I'd like to think we offer a complete lifestyle for our customer. So whatever aspect of her life that she's doing, we can cater for that and we can provide clothes for that. Whether you're walking the dog, you're going to your first really important interview, um, you're out in the countryside, you're riding. I mean, you know, we are, I like to think, and I, I wanted to deliver a, a brand that can cater for every aspect. I don't want you to think, well, I've got to go somewhere else because you're not doing that yet. Um, and we are doing most things now. Um, but in terms of when was that moment, I always wanted to create that all-encompassing brand. Of course, that takes time. You can't do that all at once. But the initial idea for me, and you know, when was that moment where I thought there's, there's something missing in the market, was going to the country events and I couldn't find anything to wear. We were all wearing the same thing. So you were going to country events just as a, as a as customer? A customer. Yes. Yeah. And I thought, well, hang on. I was looking around and there were five of us in the same jacket. And I thought, this is really odd. You wouldn't do this in any other aspect of your life. So that was the initial moment where I thought, there's, there's a gap here for, mm. for beautiful clothes that make you feel feminine, but are still applicable for what we're doing. And do you think that's because it, it strikes me that quite a lot of fashion is quite city focused. It tends to come from cities yes. and relatedly, it tends to focus on cities. And it's always struck me that there was a sort of missing link there. You know, Britain is among other things, a place of countryside. It's a, you know, yeah. it, it was a rural country until, you know, industrial revolution. Why has there been that missing link? Why was there that gap that, that you could fill, do you think? I think, I don't know, I think maybe fashion's always been so focused on the city, it, it just got forgotten, mm. which for us has been amazing because mm. actually there's so many women, and you're all testament to this, looking beautiful, but mm. there's so many women that do live in the countryside or they have a house in London and in the countryside, mm. but when they come here, they don't want to just think, well, there's nothing for me to wear and now I'm going yeah. to put this frumpy old jacket on and be done with it. I yeah. think women want to feel empowered in every aspect of their lives and so they should be. Yeah. Um, so for us, that's been brilliant because it was a little bit of a forgotten entity. Yeah. So you were, you, so you were turning up at these events, you were thinking, I don't want to wear the same jacket as her and her and her. Yeah. Um, what happened then? Um, I thought... I can do something here. So <laughs> I remember writing a business plan to one of my lecturers that was at university. And so you were how old at this point? Um, Given that you started telling eggs at eight. I yeah. Mean, I, <laughs> I was this is all so precocious. 2021, I think. Of so course I'd, you were. I'd been there for a year and I was already thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. I need to find something. I'm hungrier for this. I want things to happen quicker. Mm. Um, so I put a business plan together and he said to me, do you know what, Jade? You should definitely leave here. 
and do this. And my parents were brilliant. And they said to me, look, we, you know, if this is what you want to do, we will support you, but you have to do this. And this mm. is going to be bloody hard work. Mm. And I don't think I'd realised quite how hard it was going to be um, until I was in it. So that was too late then. I'd opened the stand, we were stood there, and I thought, well, this is it. I've left uni, I've got no qualifications. I've said I'm going to do it. I've got to do it now. And I was just you know, I am very determined and there was just no two ways about it. I was going to make it work. And it sounds as if there was a period of your life when your most meaningful relationship was with the trailer. We have talk a really us, long-standing relationship. Talk us through the trailer. the trailer, you in the trailer. So I would, I think in, in my first year of trading, I did 36 shows, um, which basically entailed me in a trailer and a friend of mine going to the event, setting up the stand, you know, making it look nice, getting the clothes there, doing the event, setting it down, getting back in the trailer and going to another event. And, you know, sometimes you'd finish setting down at one in the morning, you're driving through the night, you're setting up again. And it's hard. It's mm. really hard. And it's not just, you know, it's not just an event. You're putting everything into it. It means so much. You've got, you know, you've got to make the money. You've got to sell the clothes. And, you know, it was exhausting, but it was the best training I could have ever had. It taught me everything that I know now because, you know, you're on a stand with the general public and they are not going to hold back. If they don't like it, they'll tell you they don't like it. And I learned so much. I learned about trading. I learned about communication. And more importantly, I learned about what does my customer want? I was seeing real women trying the clothes on. So I wasn't in a design studio, seeing it on runway models and then hoping it was going to be commercial. It was a very good way for me to see what worked. And then in that process, I was thinking, right, now I want to make a jacket. Now I want to make a waistcoat. Now I want to make this. So, so because what, what was the original offering? What did you start? I mean, it's striking going around the boutique, the beautiful boutique just now. You know, the, there's everything in there. There is a whole world of, of Holland Cooper. You and your trailer presumably didn't have a whole world in we it. Didn't, what were you thankfully. selling right at the start? Um, we were mini skirts. I had 30 mini skirts on the stand, um, and that was my first offering. And then it grew into, you know, doing a waistcoat, and then a gilet, and then a jacket, and then the trailer got bigger, and then you know the stand got bigger, and then I had to send some clothes because they didn't all fit in the trailer, and it evolved like that really. Um, but it was a fantastically organic way to grow the business, and. And it, I mean, even the miniskirt thing, it's funny, isn't it? Because you think of a miniskirt and you sort of think Mary Quant, swinging sixties, you think London, you think Carnaby yes, Street. Yeah. And yet here we are, you know, this is miniskirts in the countryside. It shows the nonsense of these cliches. So what were these, what kind of fabrics were you using? Well, it those? was all tweeds. Right, okay. Tweed and leather. Um, and some of the, the leathers that we used were offcuts from Mum's studio that we got out, dusted off. They'd been sat there for 20 years. It was like, right, we can do something with these. But it was predominantly all around tweed and tailoring. And, and as you'll see in the, in the boutique, and if you haven't been in there, you, you must go and have a look. You'll see the tailoring is still very much at the heart of what we do. And mm. it's, it's a privilege to work with fabrics that are so beautiful. Mm. I mean, is it fair to say you've sort of, put the sexy into country dressing. It's pretty I'd like bar, to think bar so. Yeah, I'd like to think was so. Was that a kind of conscious? Yeah, because list. I like sharp cuts. I've always liked yeah. to feel feminine. And one of my bugbears when I you know, was going to these events is a lot of the clothes didn't fit very well. They were very masculine shapes. And I wanted to create a silhouette that was feminine. And mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can be empowered by those new shapes. So I think we... We breathe new life into some of those those tweeds and those beautiful fabrics. And I mean, it shows the degree to which it, it's resonating. You've got some amazing figures, you know, turnover at 40 million, huge growth in the last year. I mean, it was a, it was a punt at the beginning, wasn't it? It was a bet. So it must be incredible for you. Was it 2008 you, you were founded? So, you know, a good few years on, but not that far on to be seeing it all kind of coming to fruition. It, it's amazing. And I... You know, we are growing and, and it's fantastic to see that. And we have an amazing team of people. And I can't stress enough about the importance of having the right team around you and those people. It's like a family. And they have to believe in you and they have to believe in the vision that you're creating and they have to get behind it. And when you're in a growth business, every year it's different. So you're expecting people to go on this journey. It's never the same. What you did last year might not be working this year. 
So I'm incredibly lucky to work really closely with an amazing group of people that believe in what we're doing and make all of that possible. I mean, talking about believing what you're doing, you are, I mean, you're, you're too modest to mention it, but you are aided and abetted by some pretty, pretty bold face um, customers. I mean, obviously it's me, but aside from me, there's <laughs> someone you may have heard of called Kate, uh, the Princess of Wales effect. I mean, she, she loves Holland Cooper. She wears it quite regularly. Talk me through a day when Kate is seen in something that you design. That, what does that day look like? A lot of missed calls on my phone and thinking, has somebody died? What's happened with 48 missed calls? Um, it, look, it's amazing. And, and when she wears something, it's, it's a global um, impact. And you can see online almost the globe goes green. So, so the, the, the global power of her is, is incredible. And to be honest, there is no better figure for us um she looks incredible everything she encompasses is is amazing and it's such a privilege to have her wearing the product and she chooses what she wants to wear you know she isn't somebody you can pay to wear something it's completely organic so that makes it even more special i think do you get any warning or is it literally no. the first thing you know is I your wish phone did. lights up and so does my whole team because <laughs> sometimes she can have something for two years yeah and just wear it and you're hoping to God it's in stock and do we have the fabric and, um, you know, everyone's running around like headless chickens. Oh, so it could actually be from a previous absolutely. collection. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. So what happens, so say she wears a particular fabric and you don't have that in the current collection, what do you do then? Panic. What? <laughs> and think we've missed loads of sales. Um, well, we, you know, we, I think also it, it, it must be said that all of the mills and the factories that we work with have worked with me from day one and they're so proud, obviously, when this happens. So they will move heaven and earth for us as well. And, and that's a lovely relationship because they are part of the family. Um, so if, if they don't have it, they will be trying to get it to us quickly. And um, luckily recently she's been wearing things. We do have a new product and she's really been embracing the power suit and she looks fantastic in it. And so many women are now feeling brave enough to wear that. Mm. Whereas I think a few years ago, I'm not sure we were confident enough to wear that, that power combo, but I'm seeing it more and more now, and it's brilliant. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, with her, is that you think about how she dresses, because obviously in terms of her country persona, she was always loved her, tra you know, her trousers and things, but if she was sort of dressing up, it was, it was a dress, it was, wasn't it? yeah. And actually, yeah, she is Recently, working she's, a suit. She's and, really embracing that. Yeah, and yeah. it shows, because her look is normally quite feminine, it shows how feminine some great tailoring can look. Yeah. And she, you know, she obviously looks beautiful in it. So yeah, and that that global reach. I mean, what does that mean? Where where's your most far flung customer? Um, well, last week we had somebody that came to the boutique on Monday when we're shut. Uh, we open Wednesday to Sunday, and I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry, we're closed. Have you come far?" She said, "I've flown in from Australia." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh, well, we." I, I ran upstairs and I said to everyone, "Right, who can do sales? We've got to open the boutique." But that just shows she'd flown in specially to come and see us. So, mm. as far you know, far flung as that, but we have a big market in the U.S. I think, mm. which has been fueled by that Kate effect um, and that's grown organically and, it, and is a big market for us so I'd say overseas that's our, our biggest consumer base. And it feels to me you, you've got Britishness very much woven into the DNA I mean obviously there's there's the tweed there's a quite kind of British sensibility around sort of country dressing is that Britishness important for your foreign customer is that is that part of what they're buying into? I think it's hugely important um, and it, it's really important for me, when I first started, and it was with the little skirts, that was all UK made. Um, and a lot of people said to me, oh, well, you won't be able to do that when you're bigger and you better, you know, plan to, you know, you're not going to be out. This is no longevity in this. And I thought, no, I'm, I'm no, I am going to make this work. Um, and we're really lucky that the factory I sort of rang and persuaded to make five jackets for me and said, I will be big one day and I will be a big brand. Uh, now we've taken over the factory and, and we're, we're in partnership together. And it's lovely because there's such incredible tailors and, and craftsmen in the UK to produce this product. And, you know, it's lovely to see it when people appreciate that and they do understand what goes into making these jackets. They're all individually hand cut in the old school way. And there's a huge amount of effort that goes into that. And, and it's interesting as well from what you've said that actually, I think traditionally people think of, for example, tweed as quite, quite a kind of winter fabric. But in Holland Cooper world, it's a year-round purchase. It's completely trans-seasonal. And when you go into the boutique in 
uh, spring, summer or autumn, winter, you will see the tailoring at the heart of who we are. And it's the same at the events. And I believe that there's always room for a blazer or a coat in your wardrobe. And, and I think, yes, we bring things out for summer and we have our linen collection, but actually, I would wear this pinstripe suit in June and I'd wear it now. And that, that's the beauty of these products is that you can, they do work really hard in your wardrobe and you're not thinking, I'm only gonna get a month out of this product. So everything we create, we like to think that it's gonna work hard for you and it's not just a one trip pony. Mm. And one of the things that I wanna ask for me really, because I've written a book that's kind of about more than anything else about positive aging, really, how age is just a number. Yeah, and we what, want these tips. And uh, you know, what, <laughs> The, the sort of the best years are ahead and that, you know, whether you're sort of 20 or 40 or 80, you can kind of have fun with your clothes and use fashion, you know, as a tool. What, how does Holland Cooper fit in? What's your age range? Who's your customer in terms of age? How is that working? It's so wide, which is amazing. And we regularly see three generations shopping the brand, um, which is everything I wanted to create. So is that, that's like a, a grandmother, like, a mother, and a, da a daughter. Yeah. And now that. we do new snowsuits. do they come in together? Suits. Yes. And do they fight over things? Is it like, sometimes, I want that later. Sometimes. <laughs> oh, my mum's got that, I wanted it. And then yeah. I, you think, well, you can share it. But that's wonderful to see that. And I, I really feel like we make all women feel amazing and mm. all women feel empowered. It's not a specific age range. And, and I think in the last three years, we've seen that more and more. And, and that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. And when we launch menswear next week, I hope it'll be a similar scenario. We mm. want to encompass all ages. Mm. Cheltenham's obviously also more sort of specifically in your DNA. And I know um, you've got a big connection with Cheltenham races. Yeah. Talk me through that. Well, we have done it for 15 years coming up and we're now the so official... So did you go, when back in the trailer days, were you, presumably, Cheltenham Racers was one of the... Yeah, Did you ever is. imagine at that Just point... Just a bit of a bigger trailer, big lorry. <laughs> did you ever imagine those, uh, with you and your mini skirts at Cheltenham Races, that you'd be sitting, sitting here today? I, at... I think I hoped that's what would yeah. happen and I certainly told everyone that's what was going to happen. From the outset, I said, you know, I'm going to be this, I'm going to make this, I'm going to do this. And I think people would look at me and think, oh, OK, she isn't. But, <laughs> you know, I'm determined and I, I, was, I wanted to be that brand that you could look around and see so many people wearing the product. And Cheltenham, I think more than any other event, we see product through the ages and it en masse. And it's mm. an amazing thing every year to come out and see more people and more women and more, wearing them in different ways. And... Mm it's almost become a bit of a club, I think. You know, women will make friends with each other because they're wearing a Holland Cooper piece and that's so lovely. But Cheltenham has become more and more of a fashion event, I think. Mm. Uh, and every year people are spending more time thinking about what they're gonna wear, their outfit, they're planning it further in advance. We're seeing people looking now about what they're gonna wear in March. So I, I think almost Cheltenham in terms of the fashion aspect has grown with us mm. and hopefully this year we're now the official fashion partner for Cheltenham for the next two years. So we'd like to think this year is going to be the biggest and best so far. And what does being official partner, what does that mean? It means that everything to do with Cheltenham Racing, they will be linking with us in terms of what to wear. Um, we're going to do an event here, I think, in the build up to the races, which will be really exciting. And then using the boutique as a, a styling mechanism for people coming to the races. And you've got specifically that que equestrian collection. Um, does that, the woman who buys that, is, can that be a sort of gateway drug to Holland Cooper? Can it be that someone starts buying things specifically to ride and then... My and then goes, Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's lots of elements like that. I think, you know, I've got women that might come in and buy a white T-shirt and then think, oh, now I'm going to buy lots of other things. And the, the same with the equestrian. And the equestrian... Um, collection has grown enormously and we're so proud to work with some of the best Olympic riders and be seeing the product really put through its paces. So it's not just equestrian product that looks nice, it is performing at the best level across mm. all the disciplines. And again, I didn't want to pigeonhole us into one discipline, I wanted to support all the disciplines. Mm. So I think when you're creating a, a luxury lifestyle brand to have an equestrian side of it that's credible, I think is a really lovely wraparound to have. Mm. And talking of that sort of wraparound and the, and the lifestyle element, you're great on Instagram. 
how important is Instagram to you as a business, but also kind of you as an individual? What does what is Instagram to you? I think Instagram is probably one of my most powerful tools to connect with my customers because I'm not doing the events all the time and I'm in the boutique as much as I can, but you're giving me feedback every day and it's across the whole business. So whether it's I received a coat and it was beautiful, but the box was damaged or I, I went into the boutique and the service was amazing or whatever it is, it's connecting me to the whole business and I'm able to see into areas that day to day maybe I'm not involved in as much. So that's incredibly powerful. And people say, oh, you know, surely you don't reply to all messages. I reply to every single message because I don't want to lose that connection. Mm. Um, and the feedback that I get from everyone is, is incredible. It's like being at a show every day because mm. people are trying on new products. They're sending me photos of what they look like. What was the journey? A link dropped out online and it wasn't working. You know, you are the best sort of panel of people to be mm. giving feedback across the whole business so it's I mean it's such a change that isn't it I think I mean speaking as a fashion journalist as well the fact that someone can directly get in touch with you I mean it's so brilliantly egalitarian to start with but it is so useful yeah it, it, it's amazing it's a tool that if I was to do without it, it, it I would feel quite lost I think mm. in terms of the connection mm. between our customers and the brand. Mm. But I do want to ask, I mean, this is probably very revealing of me. You know, you always look so perfect on Instagram. I mean, everyone looks perfect on Instagram, but you look more perfect than perfect. I mean, I, I want to know, what does, a, what does a day when Jade looks a bit rubbish look like? I mean, you must have, you must have a terrible tracksuit somewhere. We've all got that terrible tracksuit. <laughs> Lots of them, don't worry. I need to know more about that. Tell me what a bad Jade fashion day is. Um, Our little secret. We won't repeat it, obviously. Um, I, I mean, probably, you know, I don't know, a boiler suit or overalls out in the garden with the kids and the chickens. And... So you, you say you've still got chickens? Oh, yeah. So what is your go-to chicken look, Jade? Um, <laughs> probably that. Scru scruffy overalls. And, and for me, it's nice sometimes just to be out and in the garden and, you know, in muddy and scruffy clothes because... That's how I grew up, really. So actually, it's quite refreshing. And it's very kind of you to say, but I definitely don't know. I think everyone in the office will vouch for the fact that I don't look like that every day. So you are human, is what, is what you're trying to uh, Very trying much to so. Say. What about, I mean, obviously, you, you, know, you wear Holland Cooper brilliantly. Are there, if you were going to treat yourself to something from another brand or a couple of brands, what, what other brands do you really kind of admire and... Saint Laurent, I think, would be one of the brands I really adore and admire. I think their uh, product is beautiful. I think even on the runway, it, you're looking at it and you can envisage wearing it. Um, and their structured tailoring and product is, is beautiful. So I would say they are a brand I really admire. And another brand that I've always admired is Ralph Lauren for their lifestyle and the way they dress different ages seamlessly. Mm. Um, and their attention to detail in stores and the way they curate product is really beautiful amongst a lot of mediocrity now out there on the high street. Mm. Mm. How do you make, I mean, we're at this time when so many people shop online and I always talk about the power of shopping in person, you know, especially working out whether a particular shade of khaki suits you or which trouser cut or whatever. As a kind of bricks retailer, as opposed to, a, I mean, you're a bricks and clicks retailer, yeah. but looking at the bricks element, what for you is important about how, how do you make, give, give value for money to the person who turns up next door? I think you have to be completely multifaceted and we have to create an immersive experience from the moment you step through the door the lighting the smell the music how you're greeted I want you to step in and forget about everything else outside your life everything you're suddenly in a world of Holland Cooper and the team within our, our bricks and mortar stores are exceptional and they are flying the flag in a way that, you know, I, I'm so proud to say how brilliant they all are in different ways. So it's not just, a, you know, a great environment and the attention to detail on the product. It's the experience you're getting with different stylists doing it in different ways, but giving you that time. And 
as you say, we've got to find a reason for, for women to want to come out and think, well, you know, I'm going to make an effort now to, to drive and go somewhere, whereas I could just go online. And we see lots of people maybe coming in for a specific product, but they come out with something possibly completely different, or they've had an hour and a half to try on a whole range of clothes that our team can guide you through. And I think one of the things that's striking with the boutique here is, aside from just all the sort of lovely bits of furniture and places you want to sort of sit down, possibly have a glass of bubbly, is that there are lots of people there to help you and they really know what they're talking about. And I, one of my, I don't know if any of you came to one of my, my events at the festival yesterday, but one of my rants, it was a bit of a rant, was how few shops offer adequate level of kind of help really and assistance yeah. who really know the product and really knows what works for one body shape rather than the other. And it seems if you've gone, made a big effort to, to sort of resolve that. I'd like to think whoever you talk to in there is, is a brand expert and more. And I think, you know, it's so important, as you say, to be able to dress all body shapes, to be able to dress all ages, to understand the brand, understand the cuts, understand the tailoring, understand what's going to work for different body shapes and, and really be able to take you through that journey. Um, and as I say, I'm so proud of the people that work for me because they not only love it, but they are brilliant at what they do. And that's mm. so important because if whoever's coming through that door, you want them to have the best possible experience. And we only have two bricks and mortar stores, so we want to make them perfect. And yeah. I'd like to think if you've been into the boutique that you really do have a special experience and you think, wow, I really enjoyed that. I want to come back again rather mm. than... I didn't get any service and actually it was pretty tiring and mediocre and I'm not going to come again, I might as well shop online. We, you know, in retail, we've got to learn to work harder about what we do in our physical stores. Mm -hmm. And your, your first physical store, your trailer, you, when you had those mini skirts, you, you had to sort of step out to let someone step in, didn't you? Because it was so small. It was, <laughs> there were two of us standing there. I mean, it was two metres, so it was probably the width of this. So for customers to come in, we'd have to go into the aisle. <laughs> and then when you had two customers, both of us would be in the aisle. And, uh, you know, and the events are still such a massive part of who and we are. And you still do the events, don't you? And I love it. Yeah. And, and I, you know, for me, that raw trading is something... I just am addicted to. There's nothing better than seeing people trying on clothes, seeing your customer, which is why I'm always in the boutique, because I just like that hit of seeing you all and, and you know being a part of that. But the events are huge now. I think we're probably the biggest brand at all the events. We put on an enormous stand that we try and recreate the boutique in a field so no stepping outside these days absolutely not no <laughs> it, it, it no it, no stepping outside and it's it's creating that world in a field but I can't stress how important those events still are for us and mm. they're you know they're massive footfall badminton they've got 250,000 people mm. these are huge events and there's no better way to sort of showcase the brand at that level than mm. than, than using those events so that's quite enough from me I'm going to uh, ask Jay some, and ask myself, which is a bit weird, but anyway, some of the questions that you submitted. I love this question. I should have asked this question because this is a great one. Jade, if you were showing at London Fashion Week, what would your showstopper piece be and who would be wearing it? Oh, gosh. Um, showstopper, I think it would have to be one of our three-piece suits, but in one of the really loud sort of tartan checks maybe something very powerful something really heritage and punchy um who would be wearing it gosh i don't know um, i mean kate would be brilliant if we could get her in down the runway I call the cat yeah, yeah i'd well, probably say no better person it's than that what first put a twinkle in william's eye isn't it <laughs> exactly yes yeah, back in st andrews yeah, absolutely yeah. maybe with a bit of a sort of see-through top underneath absolutely that's what she was wearing perfect that time. yeah <laughs> we'll put in a call well you you should actually be the one to put in a call uh, love that idea. Okay, so question for me. What is my favourite autumn winter, winter 23 trend? Well, actually, one thing that's really interesting for me, so obviously I go to all the fashion shows, all the fashion cities, and I get back to the office having gone to Milan, Paris, New York, and London, and everyone says, oh, you know, what's the trend? What should I be wearing? And what's the colour? And I'm going to say something very fashion now. We're sort of <clears throat> post-trend in that what I really like to see as a woman and as a fashion consumer is... It's about the things that really work. So every season, it's about a blazer. It's about a trench coat. It's about a trouser suit. 
because actually we're too, however much you love fashion, we've all got lives to lead these days. We're not all yeah. just sitting sort of having lunch in Mayfair. And fashion designers, even at the most expensive levels, I think have had to sort of address that. And so there is this sort of capsule wardrobe, which actually Holland Cooper's really about, isn't it? You know, yeah. the power of a great blazer can get you a very long way. And if you get the right one, it's, it's, it's going to last you forever more. And I yeah. think also from that sort of sustainable perspective, that's how we need to shop, isn't it? It's not about buying something because it's in for autumn, winter 23, and then binning it off because it's not in for autumn, winter 24. It's about buying for the long term. And, and celebrating the, the classics. I, I couldn't agree more. I th and I think it's unrealistic to be buying a new wardrobe entirely based on a trend. I just don't think that, as you say, it's not sustainable. And financially, that's not realistic either. And a lot of your best sellers are tweaks. Season after season, you do similar shapes, similar things, and you, you tweak them because people love them. They don't want... They want another version of the same thing rather than something else entirely. Yeah, and the blazer you're wearing, the blazer I'm wearing, we've been running for probably five years. We do them in new colours, new fabrics, but the, the new product wraps around the, the classic family product, which I like to call it, that's the jeans and the knits and the classic shapes we've already got. So um, the longevity in the pieces is is amazing and I think if you, if you say as a brand we celebrate that, you, you sort of have to showcase it by actually committing and, and keeping them in, in the range. Mm. Um, and a very destination fabulous, positive aging question here for you, Jade. Your mum is a fashion icon in her own right. Well, we already know that. What was the Stand earliest <laughs> styling tip she gave you? Um, I, oh gosh, wow. Well, um, I, I think she always encouraged me to sort of make an effort and and she always said to me darling you know no matter what you're doing you, you've got to put your best foot forward and, and make an effort and um I, I think I like to think I've carried that that through all the way in my life and I mm. think for me dressing up and making an effort makes me feel like I can achieve what I need to and and you know she's done that all through her life and looks amazing every day so I've had an amazing person to look up to there but I think always making the best of what you've got and making an effort mm. I think was a good good tip mm, that sounds like a very good tip okay um one for me we're all excited to receive Destination Fabulous what's it about and why did you decide to write it well I think for me it was really it was two things I'm in this lucky position that I get to meet lots of experts, fashion experts like Jade, lots of beauty experts. I get all these kind of tips and bits of inside knowledge and I just want to put them all in one place. And the other thing, the sort of top line really was this messaging that's out there in society, which is like, oh, getting older is something to be feared. It's something to worry about. And actually, as someone who at 51 feels kind of happier than they ever did and has had her bumps on the road, but has sort of learned from the bumps on the road, really, which in a way, you know, you have in your business as well it was a book to show that getting getting older is great you can what you know you can wear a bright pink houndstooth coat at whatever age you know so so that was really the origins of that book um and I think it's so empowering for women to watch and even when I'm you know watching your Instagram and, and looking at that for women to think yes we can do this and it is okay and because I, I think it is difficult and the expectation is high, isn't it? For yeah. what we've got to do and achieve and look like. And it's a bit of a minefield, I think. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, I agree to, to encourage and empower women in a way that you do is, is fantastic. And to get those tips and think, yes, I can work with this and I can use this as a toolkit is, yeah. is really important. Yeah. Talking of tips, this is another great question. Jade, you're often seen in beautiful nudes and whites in your collection, which are absolutely stunning. Help a girl out. How the heck do you manage this without getting makeup, dog paws, and handprints all over you? Um, now, it's not a tip in Destination Fabulous. I definitely need to know this for the next edition to add it in. I think, well, probably putting it on... If I'm wearing a you know a white jumper, I, I would put that on first before I do the makeup, because it's okay. fatal doing your makeup and then think, oh, yes. I'm now going to put on your white jumper. Um, 
dogs and children getting things on is just unfortunately occupational hazard. I, I don't have the magic answer for that, I'm afraid. You just, I think if you're going to an event or you're going, I'm going for a meeting in the office, I'd be putting that on just before I go in. Otherwise, yeah, you know, it, suddenly you're walking around, you've got a sticker stuck to you, baby's been sick, you know, the dog's got some food on the bottom. So yeah, I don't have an answer for that, but the makeup bit, put it on first. Or if it's loose neck, you can sort of pull it over your head without it dragging down over your makeup. Well, you do have one answer because actually a lot of your blouses and, and knits are machine washable, are. which is another reason I love the brand. And I, I have to say that is a real divider often. Brands headed up by women. There's just more things you can shove in the machine. A hundred percent. And, you know, it's not realistic to think your whole wardrobe is going to be specialist dry clean. And I think, yeah. as you say, there's nothing more irritating than shopping, getting at home and thinking, oh, this is now specialist dry clean. So... I would say 80% of our essential product is all machine washable and washes like a rag, just stuff it in. You don't have to think about it and off you go again. Yeah, that is so key. Uh, so one for me, uh, with fashion you love affair with neutrals, do you feel that colour has had its day? Well, as you can probably tell, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I love a bit of colour and I think what I love about fashion at the moment, as I said about going to the shows, is like everything, everything goes. You really can more than ever before do you, whatever you happens, happens to mean. If you love colour, you can wear colour. If you like head-to-toe black, you can wear black. You can mix it all up. You can do black. One, I mean, you're this person, aren't you? One day you'll look head-to-toe chic in black. Another day you'll be wearing bright red. It really is about picking and choosing who and what you want to be these days. And it, it's always interesting. So I'm really lucky at the shows to go backstage and talk to some of the designers. And one of the designers I regularly talk to is Maria Grazza Curie, who heads up Dior. And she talks about how Christian Dior, you know, as we all know, he did that new look of 1947 with a little jacket and a huge skirt, which looks amazing, but probably isn't so great if you're getting the bus. Um, Christian Dior is used to talk about Dior woman. And every season he would dictate what your woman was and what she'd be wearing. So one season it would be the huge skirt and the next season it would be a pencil skirt. And he would deliberately change it. So you had to buy everything all over again. I mean, in, you know, genius business model in many ways. But Maria Grazia Curie, she always talks about Dior women. She says, I've got lots of women shopping my brand and they're all different. And more interestingly, that one woman these days is women. So she's got different ways of being. So one day she might be riding her horse, the next day she might be in London. Yeah. And it's about providing options. Um, and that, yeah, I, I love that. And that, that's what you're in the business of as well, isn't it? And I think I'm, a lot of the time I'm making for myself and my life is, is that. Sometimes I'm in London, sometimes I'm here, sometimes I'm riding, sometimes I'm out in the countryside. And I think, you know, that, that is an organic way of growing the brand as well because I want to be head to toe and what do I need just in my life to be head to toe in, mm. in what I'm wearing. And it's not realistic, as you say, to think every day you're going to be sipping champagne in Knightsbridge you know that's not real life and that's not real women so if you want to cater for real women mm. you need to be thinking about a multifaceted lifestyle mm. we've got time for a couple more questions um this is another good one is there anywhere in the world you think would be perfect for another Holland Cooper store um I think if we were to do another one I think it would probably be London mm. um because we have a lot of customers over there but I, I sort of love the fact that our head, our, our flagship store isn't in London. I think that's quite nice. It's mm. a testament to who we are. Yeah, it's a statement it's of authentic. intent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I think when we opened it, a lot of people thought, God, that's bold. It's sort of in the middle of nowhere. You're not going to get anyone coming there. But actually, we're getting people flying from all over the world to come here. And I quite like that it's in the Cotswolds and it's celebrating the countryside aspect of the brand. So... If we were to do another one, it would probably be London. But I do you th do I think we will? Probably not. Mm. I think mm. I will keep it here, and it'll just get bigger and bigger, and I'll keep <laughs> adding new things in here. Jade, I love your Instagram reels. Your children are adorable. How do you manage being a mum of two and running a successful business? Well, we've answered the white clothing bit of the equation. <laughs> um, I look. I, becoming a mother is the best thing I've ever done um, and I think when I was first pregnant I thought oh my god what am I doing I'm not going to be able to do this and it is a juggle as, a, as anyone knows but um, I think what I try and do is when I'm working be really focused at work and when I'm with my children be really focused with them so I'm not 
try, you know, I think if you try and do everything at once, you feel like you're failing and doing everything badly. Um, but it, it's a roller coaster for sure. It changes your life beyond all recognition, but I think in the best way. Um, and I'm lucky to have fantastic support. So when I am at work, I can fully focus on that because this, I always say this is my first child and probably always will be. So, <laughs> it, I, you know, I have to focus on maybe this. Maybe you won't I'm tell here. your actual children no. when they're grown up. Another little <laughs> yeah. secret to keep between us there. And, and um, just to finish, what's next? What, what, what are the plans for the future? I mean, you've got the Cheltenham, Cheltenham Races hookup coming up. You've got some expansion plans here, but what else should we be expecting from Holland Cooper? Well, we've got menswear launching next week. So for the men in here, we've got something for you. Um, I think we've got exciting new product categories launching for spring, summer next year. Um, we're celebrating 15 years of the brand next year. So there's going to be lots of highlight moments there. And probably our, our biggest thing in terms of internally is we're building a 70,000 square foot new office here, which hopefully will be ready at the end of next year, which will mean my whole team will be based in one place, which at the moment we're dotted around between four different offices. So that's gonna be a massive moment for us and also to be able to showcase the brand in a different way and it will allow us to expand the boutique and have a menswear side where I'd really like to have a Savile Row tailor base so you can come and have a bespoke suit wow. cut here for women and men, oh, love that idea. which will be a really nice um, addition to what we've got at the moment and a very personal touch and to see the product, the patterns being made and things. So um, that's, I think, really exciting in the pipeline. And then on from that, I couldn't tell you. We're just pushing as hard and fast as we possibly can at the moment. <laughs> and you're, But you're not going to be giving up on your trailer life or your shop assistant life. We're no. still going to be seeing you yeah. at the cutting edge. I'm in everything. This is very good to know. <laughs> so um, thank you everyone for being here. We're going to be on stage for a little bit. If anyone wants their picture taken, I mean, you want you need a picture of it taken with Jade. I'll, I'll stand well back. Oh, no. I am going to be here to sign books. There's also some extra copies to buy if you want to get an early Christmas present or whatever. We all know Christmas is going to be here in three minutes. Um, but just hang out, have a chat with each other, have a chat with us. Jade's here to answer any questions, as am I. And thank you so much for coming here.